Geometry nodes is a tool for non-destructive procedural and parametric generation of objects. This video presents a workflow to assemble a single node tree which will generate multiple parametric variations of an object and then scatter them at points of choice. In this video, as an example, we will generate multiple parametric variations of a flower object. The workflow itself is divided into four stages. First, we will generate a bunch of points. Then we will generate multiple parametric variations of the flower object on each of these points. Then we will scatter these variations at points of our choice. And lastly, we will do some parametric shading. Here I have started a new Blender file. I am using Blender 3.5 Alpha, though the workflow here will work for version 3.4 onward. The render engine is EV. I'll switch on the screencast keys add-on. Blender's built-in Node Wrangler add-on is a big help when working with nodes. Always a good idea to have it switched on. I will switch to my custom Geometry Nodes workspace. First, I will rename the custom object to let's say Paraflower. Also, I will rename the Geometry Node setup to say Paraflower GN. Do remember to save your working file periodically. First, let's add a points node. This will place a point at the position 000, which Blender identifies as the world origin of its digital space. For the sake of visibility, let's instance a curved circle on this point using the Instance and Points node. This circle will act as a ring on which we will place the flower petals later in the video. The curve circle is now visible in the viewport and also in the spreadsheet. By increasing the point count, we can now create multiple circles as instanced object, all of them centered at position 000. In stage 2 of the workflow, we will create a different parametrically generated flower object on each of these points. For that purpose, at this stage we have to store a couple of attributes of the points generated by the points node. Practically speaking, attributes are properties attached to different domains of a geometry, which can subsequently be used as a parameter in the geometry node tree or in the shading process. Attributes can also be different values assigned as data types to the different domains of a geometry. First attribute to store is the index of the points. Since index values are integers, so set the data type to integer. Set domain to points as there is no other domain as of now. And connect the index node to the value socket. Let's name it flower index. The second attribute to be stored is the total point count. To get the total point count, we will use the domain size node. Select point cloud from the component drop down list and connect it to the points node. Connect point node to the attribute value socket. Let's name the attribute as flower count. Let us organize the nodes by adding a frame to the points and the two stored attribute nodes. Let's name them Points Generation. To adjust the frame, select it and from the sidebar properties, uncheck the shrink box. Now you can drag adjust the frame. This completes stage 1 of our workflow. Before proceeding to stage 2, let's make a short detour to stage 3 and scatter these points to improve visibility and comprehension of our work in stage 2.
To achieve the objectives of this video, we will scatter the generated points using a set position node. This is the key takeaway of this video and indeed the key to the whole workflow presented in this video. So let's add the set position node. At this stage, we only want to scatter the points randomly between two coordinates on xy plane at z is equal to 0. So connect a random value node to the offset socket. Set the data type to vector. Minimum to minus 20, minus 20, 0. And maximum to 20, 20, 0. The z values are set to 0 for now so that scattering happens only on the xy plane where z is equal to 0. As you see in the viewport, the set position node is scattering the instant circle objects randomly between coordinates minus 20, minus 20, 0 and 20, 20, 0. If we now plug the realized instances node to this instant geometry, we will see that the set position node is now randomly scattering each vertex of the realized geometry, resulting in a complete mishmash in the viewport. But we do not want the set position node to scatter either the instant geometry or the realized geometry. What we want set position node to scatter is these initial points. For this, we have to plug this stored attribute of the index of the points to the ID socket of the random value node. So add a named attribute node. Select flower index attribute from the drop down list and connect it to the ID socket. Now the set position node is scattering the initial points which are actually generated at position 0 0 0 and whatever geometry we create over these points, the set position node will append that geometry to the scattered points. Let's organize these nodes into a frame and name them scatter points. In this stage, we will append flower petals to each of the vertices of the circles or rings. But before that, we will create some parametric variables. We will be using some maths in this stage. And the important point to remember is that all the points are located at position 0, 0, 0. Pivot point for all the math operations will also be this position, which is also known as a word origin in Blender. First, we will randomly scale the circle instances. Set the float value between 0.5 and 0.9. Now, each of our flower object will have a different radius for the rings of petals. Second, we will randomly resample each of the curved circles. For this, we have to first realize the instances and then add the resample curve node. Add a random value node to the count socket. Counts are integers. So select integer as data type and set the value between 4 and 12. Set seed value of your choice. In the viewport, you can see each of the randomly scaled circle now has a random vertex count. Each of our flower object will now have a different number of petals per ring. Since we are going to add a petal leaf to each of the vertices of the circles, let's assign and store an attribute for each of the vertices. Add store name attribute. Select float as data type. Point as domain. And add a random float value between 0 and 1. Let's name it petal vertex. Now each vertex of the geometry has a distinct random float value attribute between 0 and 1 attached to it. Let's organize these nodes into a frame 
and name them resample rings. As of now, all our flower objects have only a single ring of petals each. So let's add a random number of rings to each of the flower objects. Add duplicate elements node before the realize instances node. Since the circles are still instances at this point, so select instance as the element to be duplicated. Add random value node to the amount of duplicates. Since amount is an integer, set data type to integer and set values minimum 3 and max 6. In the viewport, you can see that each of our flower object now has a multiple ring of petals, randomly ranging from 3 to 6. You can set a seed value of your choice. Here, we will store the duplicate index of each of the duplicated circles as an attribute. Add store named attribute node. Select integer as data type since index is an integer. Select instance as domain. And connect the duplicate index socket to the value. Let's name it ring index. Let's organize these nodes into a frame and name them rings. Next, let's scale these duplicate petal rings, that is the duplicate circles. Since these duplicate circles are all instances, so we will use the scale instances node. This time, we will not scale them randomly as we had done earlier, but we will scale them sequentially using their index number. We have already stored their index number as an attribute, so we will use the named attribute input node. Select ring index from the drop down list and connect it to scale socket. Now, index values of the duplicated circles go in series 0, 1, 2, 3. Since scaling anything by a value of 0 is 0, all the duplicated circles with index 0 have disappeared. To bring them back, we add a number 1 to each index value. Thus, the index values of the duplicated circles now are in the series 1, 2, 3, 4. All the circles are visible in the viewport. The scaling factor is still quite large. To bring it down, we can use a linear multiple. But for better visual results, here we will use a power factor. Setting the exponent value very low, like 0.2 or even 0.1. We can also use negative base values. Actually, let's just set the value at minus 0.2. At this stage, all the petal rings or circles are located on the same xy plane where z is equal to 0. We can adjust the plane of duplicated circles by adjusting the z value of the center of the scale. Connect a multiply vector math node to the center socket of the scale instances node. Connect our ring index attribute to the top vector and set the multiplier to 0, 0, 0.2. In the viewport, you can see each duplicated ring has shifted on z-axis sequentially as per their index. Fourth and the last thing we can do here is adjust the relative rotation of the duplicate petal rings. For this, we add the rotate instances node. We only want to adjust the relative rotation of petal rings around z-axis. So add a combined xyz node to the rotation socket and connect the named attribute ring index to the z socket.
For better control, we will add a multiply math node. Now we can adjust the relative rotation of the duplicate petal rings with the multiplier value. Let's organize these nodes into a frame and name them Rings, Scale and Rotation. We have now built in enough parameters to control various variations of our flower object and we will now proceed towards generating the petal leaves. First, we will extrude all the vertices of the rings so that they form the length of the petals. Up until this point, all the rings are curves by definition. First, we have to convert them to mesh using a curve to mesh node and then add an extrude mesh node, setting the mode to vertices. In the viewport, we can see edges project out in normal directions from each vertex. Let's randomize the offset scale of each edge projection. Connect the random value node to the offset scale socket and set the float data type value between 3 and 3.3. .3. Each edge now has its own different length. We can control the direction of the edge projection by first adding a position node and then adding a vector math node and changing the z value. To randomize the projection direction, we add a combine xyz node and plug a random float value node to its z value. Now each vertex has its own direction of projection. Here, let's try two options for constraining the edge projection direction. We can constrain the direction per flower object by plugging the named attribute flower index to the random value id socket. Now each flower object has its own direction and all vertices of the object share the same direction. Another option, and my opinion the better one, is to constrain the direction per ring by plugging the named attribute ring index to the random value id socket. Each ring now has a distinct direction and all vertices of the ring now share the direction. Let's organize these nodes into a frame and name them Petal Extrusion. For our next step, we will separate the edges that will become the petal leaves from the circle rings they are projecting from. This is made very simple by the separate geometry node. We will set the domain to edge and connect side socket of the extrude mesh node to the selection socket of the separate geometry node. In the viewport, the selected edges are now separated. Before converting these edges into petals, we will add some flowery waviness to these edges. 
For better visualization, let's mute the scattering of the points. In the viewport now, all the flower objects are visible centered around position 000. In the spreadsheet, you can see the number of vertices is twice the number of edges, which means there are only two vertices per edge. For waviness, we need more vertices per edge. So first, let's turn these edges into curves using the mesh to curve node and then add the resample curve node and set the count to 16. Now each edge is a curve with 16 control points. Let's add a set position node and use the position of each control point to add waviness to the curve. The set of nodes that we need here are the distance vector math node which calculates the distance of each vertex from position 000, the multiply math node which sets the wavelength, the add math node which sets the phase, the sine math node calculates the sine value for the distance and feeds it to the multiply add vector math node. Setting the multiply values to 0, 0 will limit the offset of the vertex in the z-direction only. Adjusting the wavelength, face and z-multiply values will give us suitable waviness to all the edge curves of the petals. I'll unmute the scattering of the points now. In the viewport, each flower object is now scattered back to its random location. We will now use our three stored attributes on vertex, petal rings and the flower objects to give final shape to our petal edges. First we will bring in the named attribute node, select petal vertex and connect it to the id of the random float value node which we will then connect to the wavelength multiplier value. This will set a different wavelength value to each petal leaf within the set min max range of the random value node. Next we will bring in the second named attribute node, select ring index and connect it to the id of a random float value node which we will then connect to the phase add value. This will set a different phase value for all the petal leaves on each petal ring within the set min max range of the random value node. Lastly, we will bring in the third named attribute node, the flower index and connect it to the id of a random float value node which we will then connect to z value of a combined xyz node and connect it to the multiply add vector node. This will set a different z offset value for all the petals on each flower object within the set min max range of the random value node. The z value of the add vector can be used to set the z position of all the objects. Let's organize these nodes into a frame and name them petal waves. With this, we are now ready to finally generate petals of our flower object. We begin by adding a curve to mesh node and add a curve line as its profile curve. Set the values of the curve line to minus 100 0, 0 and 100. 0, 0. To give it a petal shape, we will use a set curve radius node. We will bring in the spline parameter node, connect its factor to a float curve and connect its output to the radius. We can now set the shape of the petal by shaping the curve of the float value.
as of now our petal is a flat plane. We can give it a curve shape by using a set position node here and using the spline parameter and float curve setup. Nothing happens because our curve line has only two vertices yet. So we add a resample curve node. Let's set the vertices count to 5 or 7. And adjust the float curve shape. A higher vertices count will make the geometry heavy. So for this video, we will set the count to 3. Before we wrap up our flower modeling, we have to store couple of attributes of the petal leaf which we will use for its shading in stage 4 of this workflow. We add two store named attributes node and a spline parameter node. Both will have float as data type and point as domain. We will store the length of the petal as an attribute by connecting the length socket of the spline parameter to the value of stored named attribute. Let's name it petal H. We will store the width of the petal as an attribute by connecting the fax socket of the spline parameter to the value of stored named attribute. Let's name it petal W. Let's organize these nodes into a frame and name them petals. With this, we conclude stage 2 of this workflow. In our earlier detour to this stage, we have scattered the flower objects randomly. Now we will scatter them in two more ways. First on vertices of a grid and then on random points on a plane. Let's bring in another set position node and add a mesh grid. Set size to 30 by 30 and vertices to 5 by 5. We will position each of our flower object on each of the vertex of the grid. For this, we need to sample the position of each vertex of the grid with a sample index node. Connect mesh output to geometry. Since position is a vector, set data type to vector, set domain to point, connect position node to value, and connect the value output offset socket of the set position node. In the viewport, you will see a flower object on vertex with index 0. Position a flower object on each vertex of the grid. All we need to do is connect the store named attribute of the flower index to the index socket of the sample index node. In the viewport now, each index of the grid has a parametric variation of the flower object. Let's organize these nodes into a frame and name them scatter2. We can easily modify the setup for random points on a plane. Let's copy the entire setup. Set vertices count to 2 by 2. Add a distribute points on faces node. Select poison disk method. Set density max to 1. And increase the distance min. In the viewport, different parametric variations of the flower object are now randomly scattered on the mesh grid plane. You can organize these nodes into a frame and name them scatter 3. We have now completed our parametric modeling of variations and learned to scatter them at points of our choice. This brings us to the close of stage 3 of our video. 
In this video, we will only be focusing on exploring shading use cases of our stored attributes. Let's slide out the shader editor window and switch the viewport to render view mode. I already have a background world shader set up for this stage. Let's create a new material, name it paraflower sh and assign it to the petals of the flower object. First, let's generate a different base color for each of our flower objects. For this, we'll use a stored flower index and the flower count attribute. We will access them through the attribute shader node. We have to type in the exact name for each stored attribute. The flower index as we know is an integer value in the series 0, 1, 2, 3 and so on. For shading purpose, we will convert it to a range between 0 and 1 with a map range node. Connect fact value of the flower index attribute to the value socket. The input value starts from 0. The max input value will be the flower count minus 1. The output range thus is between 0 and 1. We can now use this range as fact input for a color ramp node. To convert grayscale to color, select HSV as color mode and FAR for color interpolation. Set colors of choice for the stops. In the viewport, a different base color appears for each of the flower objects. You can also adjust colors by adding stops. Next, we will explore the use of UV for each petal. We can view the face orientation of the petal leaf faces from the overlay drop down options. Let's access the petal height and width attributes in the shader editor using the attribute node. Type petal h for the height attribute and petal w for the width attribute. We can view each of the attributes in the viewport. The petal w goes from 0 on the left to 1 on the right. The petal h values go from 0 at the bottom to 1 at the top. We can use a subtract 0.5 value and an absolute math node so that petal w now goes from value 0 in the middle to value 1 at either sides. We can connect them using a combine XYZ node to generate an XY UV map for each petal leaf. We can now add a multiply math node to both attributes to adjust the spread of the values. We can now add a hue saturation value node to give a different hue color to each flower object. Hue values vary between 0 and 1. So we can use our setup created earlier. Now you can see in the viewport a different color for each flower object. Let's go a step further and assign a separate saturation value to each ring of the petals. For this, we will need our stored ring index attribute. Connect it to a map range node. The input values of the ring index vary from 0 to 5 as the number of rings vary from 1 to 6 max. We can use the color ramp node for better visualization. You can see in the viewport each ring of petals has a separate grayscale value. We can plug the map range output to the saturation socket of the HSV node. The saturation values of the HSV node can go from 0 to 2. So we can set 0 and 2 as output values of the map range node. For better visual results, let's set output values to 0.8 and 
Similarly, we can set the values of each petals separately. Bring in the petal vertex attribute and connect it to a map range node. The petal vertex have random values assigned between 0 and 1. So the input values of the map range node will also be 0 and 1. We can preview in the viewport each petal now has a separate grayscale value. We can now plug the map range output to the value socket of the HSV node. For better results, let's set the map range output values to 1 and 2. With this, we conclude the stage 4 of our workflow. Let's use the generated UVs as base color for the principal BSDF shader. This brings us to the end of this video. We can adjust various parameters and generate a final setup of our liking. This workflow can be utilized for generating multiple instances with parametric variations of any node group setup. The stage 1 and 3 will remain common, whereas for stage 2, you will need to develop your own set of attributes and parameters for generating variations of your node group and use those parameters and attributes for rendering in stage 4. Hope this video has been of some help and you have learned something useful for your working with geometry nodes. Thank you for watching. Happy nodling and happy blending.